All right, there we go. Well, good morning, everyone. We are on week two of a six-week series, and like the crowds in the day of Jesus, we're going to follow him around as he ministers along the Sea of Galilee, and have entitled the series, Six Weeks at the Sea of Galilee, Invaluable Lessons from the Lord of Life. And in week one, we saw the compassion of Jesus. And I really was kind of caught off guard by that, just thinking about um, the situation that he was in. In fact, we looked at that last week where Jesus has received news, and so he decides he wants to be alone. And so he actually wants to be alone so much that he gets in a boat, (laughs) and gets away from the crowds and finds some alone time. But as he gets to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, two things stand in the way way of his alone time with the Father. One is the presumption of the people, and two is his compassion for those people. So they're presuming on his time, they're presuming upon his energy, and that he's ready to minister to them. And they're right. He is ready. And so we looked at how amazing it was as he saw the needs of all these people when really it wasn't a good time for him. Um, He was very busy and was probably very tired and he was just ready to have some alone time with the Father. And instead he saw the crowds. It doesn't say that he grappled with it or he thought to say, come on guys, give me some time. But just immediately his heart was moved with compassion. And so I kind of try to challenge uh, myself first, but then all of us, and certainly as a church, um, with what would it look like if the people of God were moved with compassion first? As we saw human need, and there's a lot of dissecting of the legitimacy of need and whether people are being responsible and what kind of need, but I just wanted to take Jesus' example, his first response was compassion. So I encourage us to have a compassion first response to human need. And I said, what would it be like if Walnut Hill um, had that kind of unnatural, rather supernatural compassion for people? And we know for one thing, we'd have to add another C to our four C's, wouldn't we? Care, communicate, cultivate, celebrate, And have compassion. Um, And Jesus, having compassion, he healed the people. He fed the masses 5,000 at one time. And we learned in that lesson that God can do a lot with a little, right? God can do a lot with a little, and he loves to do that. So that was last week. And this week, we're just going to move in Matthew 14. And title last week, Captivated by Unnatural Compassion. This week, Called to Extraordinary Faith. And we're going to learn a little bit uh, from Peter today. So if you have your Bibles, open up with, with me to Matthew chapter 14. And we'll look at verses 22 through 33. Matthew 14, beginning in verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. 
Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. All right, so after this amazing feeding of the 5,000, Jesus sends the disciples off. They get in the boat and, and they leave. And then Jesus is left with the crowds and he starts dismissing them. I don't know what that looked like, but he told them, go on now, you know, you, you can head back to where you're from. And he, he sent uh, the masses on. And then, verse 23 we see he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. So Jesus finally gets his time for prayer. And I kind of even find it interesting how he did this. I don't know when you like to pray or if you have certain routines and rhythms for when you uh, pray to the Lord. And I would encourage you to find uh, routines and, and disciplines for prayer. Um, but Jesus often likes to kind of retreat to prayer. He likes to go somewhere. And for him, I think it was even helpful uh, to find a place. I don't know if you have places that you like to go for seasons or retreats in prayer. Maybe you've never tried that where you um, go somewhere and you've decided, maybe with some Bible texts in mind, that you're just going to pray and read and pray and read and have extended seasons of prayer. Well, Jesus is going to do this for a long period of time. So he goes up on the mountain. That's Jesus, for whatever reason, sometimes biblically the mountaintop is kind of seen as a place where uh, God's presence uh, dwells or uh, there's at least a feeling of his presence being there. In fact, in Psalm 121, I mean, apart from Mount Sinai, Mark Carmel, and other places where there are mountaintops, but Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? There's something kind of special about hilltops. And I think elevation gives you a sense of awe too. But Jesus, he goes up to the mountain and he prays. And he has an extended period of time uh, with the Father. So Jesus just keeps on praying, and the disciples keep on paddling. The text says that while Jesus is up there praying, verse 24, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Now it's interesting, it says that they were a long ways away from the land, but you can actually figure out how far... They were away here in uh, the original language. It says many stadia. And a stadion, um, in these times, this is a unit of measure, would have been about 200 yards, which is about 185 meters. Um, but many 200 yards away from shore. And actually, if you really investigate and you see in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, the same story is shared. And there it actually says 25 to 30 stadia away from shore. So 25 or 30, 200 yards away from the shore, which would be about three and a half miles. So they've been rowing for a long time away from shore. And the text says that they've been beaten by the waves. So they've been struggling. Something has happened, even with experienced fishermen. Some of the disciples were fishermen. Um, they could get surprised by the wind. Actually, the word here is apparently uh, sometimes used as torture. Uh, they're beaten. They're, they're really struggling. They're in great distress with the water. And what I'm told about the Sea of Galilee is that um, there can be incredible storms. And has anybody ever paddled in a rowboat? Um, across a lake. Let's find out. Okay, more than last service. I felt like I was a lone paddler uh, last service. Um, but if you've ever been in a rowboat paddling, um, we would do that at Camp Four Springs. Many times I've done that just to get to another spot where I want to do some fishing with my son or whatever, and we would sneak off. 
in a paddle boat. Well, it was a whole different thing if it was a windy day, right? Maybe getting there would have been hard, or maybe getting there is super easy, and maybe it's the coming back that's just going to be a lot of work because everything is, is going. Well, the, the Sea of Galilee, from what I understand, could develop. Now, if it was a full storm, it could be eight or nine foot waves. 600 feet below sea levels, the Sea of Galilee, and just these straight line, these winds would come through kind of the mountain passes and just create quite, quite a breeze. So for whatever reason, they've hit a storm or they've hit distress in the water and they cannot get there okay, any further. They've been going for six to nine hours, covering three and a half hours. So they've, they've definitely run into trouble. And then it says... And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them, walking on the sea. So Jesus is spending a long period of time praying. So in Roman times, they would refer to watches through the night. So it would be the night watchmen would stand guard through the night, and they'd break it into shifts. And they had four of them, and this is the last one. They were four starting at 6 o'clock in the evening, going till 6 o'clock in the morning. So the first one would be from 6 to 9 p.m., second one from 9 to midnight, third from midnight to 3 a.m., and this is the fourth one. This is like 3 a.m. in the morning. So Jesus, in his social and emotional exhaustion, he's still praying. And I don't know if there's a play on words here, but this idea of at the fourth watch, here's Jesus praying and in a sense standing watch over these disciples on their journey. And in the fourth watch, he goes to them. And that should be a problem, right? Because they took the boat. (laughs) He took the boat to a very remote area. And now... He sent them on uh, without the boat. And there it says that Jesus reaches them by walking on water. Now, I don't know if this is hard for you, um, but we have moved into the zone of the supernatural, right? I had somebody, when um, this whole transition stuff was hitting the paper a little bit, um, I had a Facebook friend who was actually a former teacher that wrote, a little something nice about me. Uh, Dan Gunderson's going to be the new senior pastor at Walnut Hill Bible Church. And something nice about an all-around good guy. And I think it's going to, it might get me to, to come and try church again. And then he said, nah. He said, I, I, not unless I'm going to set aside my rational mind. And he was just being kind of humorous. <laughs> Poor Denise over there is shocked. <sighs> I think he was just trying to be funny. But what he's saying there is that he believes that the supernatural is irrational. And I would say it might be. But if there is such a thing as supernatural, if supernatural is actually real, then it would be entirely rational to believe in it. Okay? So here's Jesus. He's walking out. He's defying the laws of, of nature. And he's walking on uh, water. And in the 1850s, rationalism made a big surge after the Enlightenment, and people were coming up with creative ways to interpret all the texts. They still wanted Jesus. They still wanted the Bible, and uh, they didn't want the miraculous. So they had to come up with creative new interpretations for these passages. And the one for this one was that Jesus didn't walk on the water. He walked along the water. So he's walking along the shore to them, and they see him, okay? And, of course, that's certainly possible until you look at the disciples' (laughs) reaction, right? How did they respond? Fourth uh, watch, he came out to them walking on the sea, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. Um, People don't usually cry out in fear thinking it's a ghost because they see a friend walking along the edge of the sea, right? 
Um, this is describing something supernatural that has taken place. And there Jesus responds. Oops, I want to go back to that one. Um, Jesus responds to them by saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not, do not be afraid. Now this is kind of a special designation here. Um, he speaks to them, calms them, rec- uh, identifies himself, but he actually has a little bit extra in this identification. Ego, a me in the Greek. It, it's I am. He's saying, it is I. And it's a way to designate, it's, it's, it's me, okay? It is I, he's saying. But he's also ego, ego a me, saying, he's, he's tying back, that's the Greek version of the Old Testament I am. What's the, they may know the Hebrew, the Old Testament word for I am? Yahweh, right? And when the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush and revealed his name, he revealed it as I am, the self-existing one, the, 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 the I am who I am. So Jesus, I mean, he may have a little bit more to this than just saying, yeah, you remember me, it's me. He, all through the book of John kind of has these I am passages where he identifies I am, ego, I me, these different uh, things. And here, um, that's all he says. It is I, or I am. And uh, that a, has a calming effect. Uh, upon his disciples. But here we have then maybe what's most famously understood about this passage. It's the response of Peter. And Matthew's the only uh, one of the gospel authors that actually tells the story about Peter's response in coming out and walking on water. And Matthew may have done that uh, straight from his eyewitness account because Matthew is one of the disciples, right? So he was probably sitting in the boat and witnessing this exchange between Peter and our Lord. And here's what it says here. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, for, I don't know about for you, but for me growing up, this passage really was all about Peter's response. Um, and specifically, I would always think of this passage as, as sinking Peter, right? You just, you see his faithlessness. He's called to come out on the water, and he does it, but he can't sustain his faith. And he's a doubter, and so you just see this, this sinking Peter is kind of what the story is all about. But I don't necessarily see it that way anymore, and it might might encourage you to see it a little differently uh, too. But it is true, Jesus does scold him a bit for his faithlessness, right? He does say, um, oh, you of little faith, why do you still doubt? So Jesus is challenging his faith, but I see Peter actually exhibiting great faith and our Lord calling him to even greater faith. Do you see it that way? He's he's maybe exhibiting great faith, but our Lord is calling him to extraordinary faith. I don't know if you've ever had people in your life that you allow uh, to encourage you, not just by affirming you and telling you right where you're at is perfect, but people that will encourage you by also challenging you. Okay, A good teacher will not only affirm their students, but challenge them. A good mentor, the same thing, certainly a coach. You've got to mix in the right balance of kind, encouraging, uh, positive words, but also some strong words and some challenging words. And uh, I would say good parenting falls into that category too, right? Sometimes affirm, (laughs) I hear it, amen. Sometimes affirm, but you better challenge that kid or you're going to raise a monster. Well, here in this passage, Jesus, and again and again, he does this with the disciples. He 
calls them to a higher faith. Why are you of such little faith? Why do you doubt? He says in the book of Mark, I have it. Why are you so dull? He's kind of hard on them, calling them to think, work through this, develop a more faith. I think that's true with Jesus. I think if you're without faith, when you're with him, you're going to be called to faith. And when you have a little bit of faith, he's going to call you to more faith. And when you have more faith, he's going to call you to great faith. And when he calls you to great faith, he's going to call you to extraordinary faith. And I think that's happening right here with Peter. Peter can be all over the map, but I consider this account to be an account to be more than a story of a silly, sinking Peter. And let's look at what our Lord says here, Lord, or uh, what Peter says in verse 28. And Peter answered him when he sees uh, Jesus walking on water, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would have said that. Would you? You see Jesus walking on the water. You've been terrorized. I mean, the word here is kind of tortured on the sea. For many hours, you're exhausted, you're afraid, and then you see what you wonder is a ghost, and then there's this calming word, it is I. And then to say, Lord, I'm ready to come out of the boat. I'm not sure I would have said that. I think there's different types of faith at play even in this passage. Maybe we'll look at three uh, types of faith. Uh, one I call boatside faith, all right? Or I can see from the boat just fine, thank you, faith, right? But there's faith there. I mean, the disciples see Jesus for who he is. And maybe you in your life have come to a point where you've seen Jesus for who he is. That's a precious thing. You can identify his majesty. You can identify his divinity. You can identify his authority. I mean, that is faith. That's real, right? I call that both side faith. In this situation, it might have been the only faith that you wanted to resource in this story. But Peter really takes it to another level. And I call this one, I don't need the boat faith, right? I don't need the boat. And here, Peter's the one that initiates him coming out of the boat. Did you notice that? I think the way the story has usually been recounted in my mind, Peter sees the Lord walking on the water, and then the Lord says, come join me, Peter. And Peter says, really? <laughs> oh, boy. And he, like, steps out, and his faithlessness starts to sink. But that's not really how it happened, is it? The Lord walks on water, and Peter says, I don't need this boat. <laughs> command me to come out on the boat. If this is you, command me to come out of the boat. And I would say from that, Peter has a type of faith that is ready to go. Peter was actually like that a lot of the time. He was ready to go. But in this case, in a good way, he was ready to step out in faith. He was saying, Lord, I see you for who you are. And if you are who you say you are, and if you are who I can now see you to be, I don't need this boat. I want to be with you. And he steps out in faith. That's, that's, he's saying, I, I'm ready for that. I mean, he's just at this point just saying, I don't need this boat. Kind of reminds me of Isaiah Chapter 6, I think they maybe had that on a plaque at Bethel. Is that true, Gail? Do you remember that? Um, but it, it, they had it on a plaque, Isaiah 6. Isaiah receives this, this experience of, of seeing the Lord in his glory, and his response is, here I am, send me. I'm ready to go. And I see that in Peter. I experience the Lord. I'm ready to step out, and nothing can get in my way if I'm with him. And so he just sees around him all the things that he really needs at that moment. He needs the boat. And he ought to feel comfort and security in that boat. But in that moment, he says, 
I'm supposed to step out. And I just want to encourage all of us to take a little bit from that. I think in life, the Lord presents opportunities for us to step out in faith. Sometimes you may initiate those opportunities. I was talking to Trisha Van and Langenberg after the service, and she said, but you know what? A lot of times those situations just come. And when they come, you have to be ready. And I was, that's right where I'm at. That's right. Uh, Peter didn't plan to walk on water that day, right? But the Lord may put within you um, a sense of direction, like he wants you to do something, like you're supposed to have a conversation that might be uncomfortable or, or to seek forgiveness for somebody that, that you know that you've been holding a grudge. Or maybe there's a sin issue that you've been battling with and you're just hanging on to it like you can't make it without it. Or maybe there's a move you're supposed to make or a transition. Maybe it's a great big opportunity. Uh, Diane, we're uh, planning um, a big opportunity for anybody that would want to join us this next week. Uh, one week from today, in response to the flooding that's been taking place, actually, I shouldn't point just to Reesburg, Rock Springs, Laval, and uh, Mazamani, and Montello. They've been all over the place, Samaritan's Purse, this week. Um, but the Billy Graham uh, Association is here as well. Franklin Graham, Samaritan's Purse, Billy Graham, Chaplaincy Ministry, and they've been ministering to people that have been traumatized at this time. And so they are going to bring in, they've asked us if we would be um, a resource referral church where they could um, have us provide follow-up for all these people that are struggling. We said, we'd love to do that. And they said, well, here's what we kind of ask you to do. We want you to take this very seriously. I think Billy Graham used to be known for huge crusade, crusades, big decisions, and who knew what was going to happen with the follow-up. Well, for the last many decades, they've been really nailing the follow-up. And so they're making us make some commitments here. And we're flying a guy in from North Carolina to provide training for us to help with follow-up from flood victims, right? So we'll help them um, to not only uh, be encouraged spiritually and offer some counsel, but to help them in terms of follow-up become acclimated to the church body and to really walk beside them and kind of coach them through the process. And we said that would be great for the flood, but man, I would love it if our people were equipped and trained and ready at moment's notice for all the other crises that happened throughout the year. And they said, that's exactly where we're at. This isn't just so much about the flood of 2018 as much as equipping churches to handle the needs of those in their community or the needs of those that the Lord puts in front of them. So uh, my coordinator for this follow-up coordinator is Dynamo Diane Deering, and we are just going to encourage people to come. It's free training. It's going to be great. 6.30 to 8.30 this next Sunday in the evening, 6.30 to 8.30, and there is a sign-up, number of sign-ups in the back, and we already have 20. We would love to see, how many, Diane? 250, she said. <laughs> no, 180, she said as many as would like to come. But maybe that would really be stepping out for you. Maybe that would really be stepping out to encourage someone in their faith. Well, that's not really me. Well, isn't it? I don't know. Is the Lord maybe equipped you for that and preparing you for a moment like this? And we certainly could use more people ready to walk alongside people and help them get acclimated into small groups, discipleship, and so forth in the church. An opportunity for you to step out. But you know what the Lord's leading you to do. There are other things in your life that he's going to create opportunities for you to step out in faith. Well, Peter, at this point, is just saying, I'm ready, right? It's mainly talk. I mean, it starts with the readiness and a calling out to the Lord and saying, I'm ready. But the question remains, will he respond? And there, Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Oops, next one. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. This is quite a moment. This is quite a moment. I mean, the seas are still roaring. And in that moment, all that Peter can see is Jesus. I mean, the story of silly sinking Peter 
has to be revised a little bit here, right? With this amazing desire to be with the Lord and to trust him no matter what. He's not only said, I don't need this boat. But there's another faith. I've left the boat. He's on the other side of the boat. He actually steps into the water. Give Peter credit. He gets wet. And he starts walking to the Lord. And this falls into the category, I mean, Peter could have been included in Hebrews 11. Um, Just another expression of faith. People from of old having insecurities or uncertainties laid up before them, the call of God to step out anyways, that's called uh, unseen realities, driving those who were by faith going to step out and go for it anyways. Unseen realities, supernatural, not irrational, but supernatural opportunities laid out, and uh, Peter steps out. And I'd like to say that if you step out in faith with the opportunities that the Lord has for you, if he says, I want you to step out and give it a try, and well, but Lord, that's not comfortable. Um, that might make me feel a little uh, out of place. I really like balance in my life, Lord. He may call you to step out. And I'd like to say that when you get on the water, everything's golden. All of a sudden, it's easy. That's not how it happens, is it? Um, Things didn't suddenly become perfect for Peter when he got out on the water. There was a problem. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. Then it says in verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. There's still wind, right? As you walk with the Lord or as you have a super gaze on him and just trust him and step out, there's still going to be distractions. There's still going to be hardships. There's still going to be failures that you're going to face on this way. There's still going to be doubts in your faith. And Peter in this moment should have just kept his eyes on Jesus. And instead, he noticed the wind. Did he see the wind? I don't know. Usually you hear the wind or you see the results of the wind. But it's the wind, right? They tell me in the storms out on sea, it's not the rain. It's the wind that will kill you. And with all that was moving around, um, Peter loses his focus. And he gets distracted, and his faith is shaken, and he starts to sink. But even as Peter sinks, we got to give it to him again. He knows where to turn, doesn't he? He cries out to Jesus to save him. When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! So, Even if you step out in faith into the uncertainty of whatever God has called you to do, and you have laser-like focus and you, you walk towards Jesus, even if you do stumble, even if things do go wrong, and even if you have a failure in your walk towards Jesus, he's still there. And as Jesus, or as, as Peter is sinking in the water, he knows who to turn to. And I'm just telling you, He's growing through this stepping out in faith stuff. By him stepping out in faith, he reached a level of, of, of experience with Jesus that he wouldn't have had otherwise. And it's going to be ingrained in his head and his heart when he's sinking. Is Peter going to sink again in his life? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's going to sink. And he's not going to be like Judas, who also did some sinking Peter in this moment is going to, times where he stumbles, but he's going to know who to turn to in the Lord. I mean, if the Lord's going to be there in the end, is it really a risk to step out in faith? We ought to spend more time walking on water, I think. Uh, When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried to the Lord, save me. And immediately, Uh, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And he calls him to a higher faith. And when he got into the boat, 
then the wind ceased, right? There will be a time that the wind will cease. Might not be while you're walking on the water, but eventually there will be peace and rest for all those who are in Christ. And those in the boat worshipped him. Here's the climax of the passage. Those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I don't know what the Lord has for you in your life. Whether you're going to make the decision to step out and try something in the name of the Lord, or whether he's going to lay something in your heart that's real obvious that you're just going to have to fight in order to keep from doing. Well, I don't know what the Lord is going to provide for this church. Newspaper, they want to know, what are you planning for the future? And I said, whatever the, wherever the Lord leads. We're just so excited to enter in to a life of faith with the Lord. And where he leads us is going to be um, exciting to see. Just this past week, there were discussions in the community of what to do now that there won't be a homeless shelter, a warming uh, shelter anymore. And uh, there was a meeting that took place, and I had two other meetings that night and kind of ran down thinking I might catch them at the end. Instead, I made them talk with me for an hour and a half in the parking lot. <laughs> um, I just wanted to hear everything that they were thinking about and And uh, I think the Lord wants us, regardless of what our role may be, to have a heart for those that are in need. And I don't know what he's going to call us to do. Me as an individual, might be on an individual basis, might be you as individuals um, doing something, or it might be us collectively as a whole. I'm not making a big announcement here at all. Um, But just saying the Lord will present things before us that will require faith. And the question will be is, are we ready? I think our call is to be faithful, but also to be ready. Let's be faithful and ready for what the Lord has for us. Would you stand with me and we'll close our time with a word of prayer. Lord, I pray that you might equip us as the body of Christ Um, prepare us for what you have for us ahead and embolden us, Lord, when the moment comes for us to show our faith. And I just pray that that experience would be so transformational, so encouraging. Um, Lord, to trust you seems in some situations to be so risky, Um, but walking with you ultimately has no risks at all because we'll be with you, Lord. And in the end, uh, the waves and the wind will be stilled. So I pray, Lord, whatever you have for us, that you uh, would call us, call us clearly, and then enable us, Lord, to obey your commands. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling or sinking and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, With great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.